Before we got around the corner, he quickly indicated on his air gauge that he was right next to empty. I think, if I remember right, it was around the 10 bar mark, which you should never let it get that low to begin with. Hello adventurers, if you've ever been caught looking down at your air gauge, seeing it close to your reserve, being that 25% mark, and needing to make the decision to notify your dive master or your dive buddy and realizing it's only been like 20 or 30 minutes into the dive and worrying about it, then I have a bunch of tips for you in this video with my experience of those members panicking in various groups of my party and also how I've learned to mitigate and how over the years I've been able to almost achieve a two hour dive time on a single tank and even going down to 35, 40 meters, and I'm continuously always trying to improve even yet. Let's dive on in. Beginner divers, when they start scuba diving, often get intimidated and overwhelmed with the amount of things you have to get into and controlling your nerves throughout. But ultimately, the more experience you get and the deeper you go into your skills, you learn to master calmness, buoyancy, and trim, which enables you to ultimately improve your air consumption. When a friend of mine was first getting into scuba diving, he joined us for venturing in the Red Sea. And I remember we were making a big old circular loop around this big old coral block. And on one of the corners of the block, we had a lot of resistance from current. And we were able to struggle through and make it through the other side. But you can kind of see that between my wife and I, we will remain calm and streamlined throughout and using efficient motions while he was struggling, kicking hard and really starting to panic to some degree. After we got around the corner, he quickly indicated on his air gauge that he was right next to empty. I think if I remember right, it was around the 10 bar mark, which you should never let it get that low to begin with. I proceeded to give him my reserve and we aborted the dive. Fortunately, we caught it before he ran out of air completely and it could be very scary. And I think it definitely was very unnerving for him as well. And there's a lot of things that went wrong to get us to this point. It should have never got to this point. However, ultimately everything ended up okay. We were all together. We were nearby. I had plenty of air to share as a reserve. We aborted the dive. We locked hands and still did our safety stop and nothing went wrong beyond, of course, the failures that led up to this point. So make sure that doesn't happen to you by checking your air gauge often, knowing your limits and following the example of myself and my wife where we remained calm, our buoyancy was under control, and we had good trim which streamlined us through that current. Now let's break that down a little bit. Let's first talk about calmness. Why is calmness important? Calmness is basically having a low heart rate. The lower your heart rate, the less air you're consuming. When you start getting afraid, you start panicking. It, just, it has this downward spiral effect where your heart rate starts increasing, your air consumption starts increasing, and this basically can spiral out of control and both continue to increase until you start hyperventilating, which is going to just destroy your air consumption. So it's definitely easier said than done, but remaining calm is your end goal. And the best way to do it is to just dive more, get lots of experience, and try to notice these symptoms, the signs when you're starting to get afraid and remember your training. Remember everything that you've done up to this point. Your open water certification, all your diving experience, and everything you've been told up to this point, use that as your laurels and just take a moment and calm yourself and then proceed. Because if you start approaching that downward spiral, it's gonna get bad and your air consumption is gonna go through the roof. Not to mention your buoyancy too. So let's talk about buoyancy. The more, when your heart rate starts increasing, your buoyancy will be much harder to control because you're breathing harder and hyperventilating. One of the things you'll learn to do as you become a better diver, a more experienced diver, is controlling your buoyancy with your breath, not your BCD, your buoyancy control device. You will be using just the air in your lungs, breathing in and out calmly to control 
your buoyancy and, no, and, and controlling your depth with your lung. But you can't do that if you're losing control of your breathing and breathing hard and quickly. So having strong buoyancy thus improves your air consumption. Lastly, and with good buoyancy also means knowing how to weight yourself because if you don't weight yourself properly or you're using your PCT by adding air too aggressively then you'll find you're just wasting a lot of air filling that thing or letting air out constantly. Usually when I dive I rarely use the BCD. Usually I'll go down to my plan dive depth give it one or two puffs and I rarely touch it other than letting some air out as I'm starting to ascend by the end of the dive. And this means you have to be weighted properly. If you're weighted too much, it'll be much harder to just control your buoyancy with your lung, but you'll have to add air into your BCD. So by doing a proper weight check, you'll be able to prevent being overweighted. If you're interested in diving more into buoyancy control, I have a video dedicated for it and I'll link it up above somewhere so check it out and lastly we'll talk about trim is where you stay perfectly horizontal with your legs kicked up through the duration of the dive this streamlines your body in current and makes your movements very efficient as mentioned when i hit that current it was very important to remain streamlined because the current is going to go around you and the more streamlined you are the more efficiently you can move through the current anything less is just going to be catching the current and making you work harder which thus increases your air consumption and will start contributing to that downward spiral so calmness buoyancy and trim all of these things will improve your ability to enjoy your scuba experiences and be a safe diver and avoid using too much air too quickly and potentially in getting a dangerous situation like my friend another important consideration is how deep you are what's important is even though you're getting a full breath of air each breath you make you will consume more of the volume of the air from your pressurized tank the deeper you are. So one effective strategy of increasing your dive time, especially in a group of peers who are better at air consumption than you are, is consider going more shallow than the rest of the group. Of course, communicate with the group that you're going to do this so that you can stay with them longer and not end the dive early. But by doing it more shallow, you will effectively be able to optimize the amount of time off of that air tank. And if you even plan your dives more shallow, you should have no problem staying with your group for the entire dive. Ultimately, the better you get at scuba diving, you start seeing it as a lazy person sport because your movements have to be efficient. Regardless, being in the water requires movement. And some people, especially today, where many people work in the office, don't have proper fitness. And when they start moving, their heart works harder than someone who is slightly more fit. And thus, this will affect your air consumption. Let me tell you a story. If you've ever been on a liveaboard, or a boat where you go and stay on the boat and it takes somewhere deep in the ocean, usually that you can't get to by a normal boat. So it's usually a bigger vessel and you go somewhere fairly exclusive and you're living on board this vessel for quite some time with an exclusive group of usually other scuba divers that are experiencing it with you. Now, if you've ever been in close quarters with a bunch of strangers, you get to know each other really well. And it's a very intimate experience being on liveaboards, from my experience, and sometimes there's a little bit of drama. Liveaboard drama. Let me know if you've ever experienced it. <laughs> but I remember two days in, there was a commotion in a group that was having a hard time, being that they were a hour diver group. They were expecting one hour dives, but needing to get out at the 40 minute mark because of one individual with poor air consumption. And this individual seemed to be an experienced diver, but they were a little overweight and maybe their exercise wasn't there. It's hard to say, but they definitely were knocking the air consumption time that they should. And the whole group was about to revolt on the boat if they didn't swap out another 60 minute diver with their group so that they can get that 60 plus minute. 
dive time at the dive site. And you may have had a similar experience, especially as a beginner diver, because usually experienced divers can usually hit 60 minutes plus because they are often calm, the buoyancy is under control, and maybe they have good trim as well. But another thing that holds a lot of people back is that fitness level. And it's something I rarely hear talked about in the scuba industry, but fitness is a big bar. And let me tell you that there is two things to consider in improving your fitness level and improving your air type. One, really aerobic training that trains your lower heart rate system or your lower energy system. There's really three built-in energy systems to your bodily function. In your low energy systems, the one that kind of just keeps your body running at all times. It's what you use while walking. When you're not breathing hard, I doubt you're sitting at a desk gasping for air. You're, this is your low energy system that's basically keeping your body running at all times and it's your base level of efficiency with your energy. The more you walk, the more you hike, and the more you work out this low energy system, the better it gets. Basically, you can start getting to the point where you can even start running without going beyond the zone. Because when you start going beyond your zone two heart rate, you start going into your high aerobic system, which is a completely different energy system that you can work out separately, and you should. There is strong reasons to work out all three systems. And your third is your anaerobic system, which is really your powerhouse for lifting heavy things. Often when you do muscle training workouts, this is your anaerobic system or you're doing something like sprint. But you don't use this much in diving, maybe for small little things with current dives, but obviously it has super diminishing returns for current diving. So usually you'll use your aerobic system and often your low energy system because that's where you're going to be operating at most Time. Remember, I said lazy diver. Because you're being so lazy, you're using that low system. If you're breathing hard, then you're probably doing something wrong and should reevaluate. And you can't do that for the whole dive. You're going to use all your air. So, talking about good air consumption, keeping yourself in that low energy level, but improving that low energy system will increase the ability to continue to do more at a low energy level. So I have a video dedicated for low energy zone two running, which I'll link up here above. Check it out to learn more. Next, let's talk about the VO2 map. It's a metric that basically says how efficient your body is at converting oxygen to energy. And I'm not gonna go too much into detail in this video because you're probably only interested on how it improves your consumption. But obviously, the better your body converts oxygen to energy, you can see that you need less air for energy and thus better air consumption. And improving your VO2 max capability relies on working your high energy system. So that's not the low energy system I was just talking about, but the high energy one. What's cool is you don't really need to work out the high energy system too often, maybe like once a week, but it requires you running as hard as you can, usually for four to six minutes at least, to have basically, to have your heart redlined as hard as you can run for four to six minutes, and sometimes doing that in intervals. So to improve your VO2 max, usually relies on high intensity interval training. So this really goes to show how you need to make sure you're working out all of your energy systems because it's really a balance that you need to hit with these energy systems to have the full efficiency and improvements to your body. And just to complete it, I'm gonna just talk about how anaerobic or really weightlifting or sprinting also helps with some stability movements and being able to fin properly and hold your body in a good trim shape throughout the dive. So I'm gonna just touch on that briefly and throw that in as the selling point for why you gotta work out all three energy systems, anaerobic, your low energy system, and your high energy system aerobic to complete your fitness level, which will decrease your air consumption and improve your dive time overall. Next, let's talk about having slow and deliberate movement where every motion 
feels strategic and every beat feels prolonged and unhurried. This is where conserving air becomes an art form. Let me tell you a story about when I was diving in Palau. I believe it's called the German Channel. And this is a popular place to go to see oceanic or reef manta. I can't remember off the top of my head. And we were getting down to the dive site and you don't control the wildlife. So we we're there waiting quite some time for the mantas. There was this couple and they were zooming all over, especially the man of the counterpart, especially one member of the team. And you can see that he was swimming with his hands and he was kicking furiously here and there. He was kind of, it was kind of nauseating just to watch how fast he was zipping all over the place. Like he had some place to, like he had something to prove or he was trying to race everyone else to the finish line. But what was funny is we were just there at the dive site. We're waiting for the mantis to show up and we're just kind of looking at things while we were waiting. And as soon as we started spotting one manta, two manta, three manta, four manta, they're all coming at the same time. He ran out of air. We were just ready to port the dive. However, fortunately, the dive master, most everyone else had so much air that he had plenty to siphon off of. The dive master just gave him his auxiliary regulator and we were able to just stay still and enjoy the mantis for quite some time. And I know some people will disagree with this and would say that we should have aborted the dive. However, I'm quite happy we were able to stay and enjoy the mantas, and it was a beautiful dive, to be honest. But this one individual almost ruined it for the entire dive team, and can actually be ruining it for other dive teams, because you may not always have a dive mask that's willing to kind of break the rules a little bit and give the support extra air instead of aborting, or maybe you won't have extra air to give. So let's break down what went wrong. Number one, I'm going to say that one of the things you have to make sure you do regularly and religiously on your dives is checking your air gauge often. Within every three to five minutes, just have an eye on it. Usually the more you dive, the more experience you get, you'll usually know roughly how much air consumption you're using but until you can really see that you're trending over hundreds of dives and how well you can conserve your air, I would say keep your eyes peeled on that thing and start noticing how long it is that you're taking to use your air. You want to get to at least an hour. Otherwise, you're going to be bothering other scuba divers because an hour is usually the standard dive time for most dive sites, especially in national parks. They have regulations that say each dive is going to be an hour max, but everyone wants to hit that max dive time. There are places where it's open water and you can take as long or as little as you want and that's on you and no one's really going to be bothered by air consumption if you're just paired with a buddy. However, if you're with an experienced group, the better your dive time. The last thing you want to be is the person who's bringing up everyone earlier, way early than what is expected. But just being able to measure yourself. Like I'm a 40 minute, I'm at the 40 minute dive mark. I'm able to make a tank last about 40 minutes. And of course there's different tank sizes. Once you get the hang of how long you're taking to consume the air on your 80 liter, have a good bar to measure yourself and improve on. And also you'd be able to match yourself with the correct group on board of the boat. If you can't hit that 60 minute dive time regularly, then it's worth noting and asking the boat to put you with the correct group so you don't get on anyone's nerves. And honestly, if you go into the dive and notify everyone in the group that where you are, if you're limited, people will have some great suggestions for you. Take the tips I have in this video and usually people will be much more cool with it than a surprise when everyone's having to end your dive much earlier than expected. Secondly, trying to make sure where you're going. Don't wander around aimlessly. Usually you'll have a dive plan, so pay attention at dive plan. Usually when you have the plan, try and stick to it and know what everyone's going to be doing, especially if you are someone who is expecting that your air consumption is going to be kind of close on the mark for what everyone else is expecting. And of course, don't be like this person and using your arms and kicking hard. You want to have good trim, which honestly means being flat, but also 
not using your arms, and being as streamlined as possible, and noting whether you're frog finning or flutter kicking. And I do want to note whether you're frog finning or flutter finning. It really doesn't matter from my experience, and I'm sure I'm going to raise some ruckus potentially in the comments. I haven't noticed a big difference in air consumption. Frog finning is great for when you're close to the ground and ensuring you do not kick up sand or silt. But I have tested this fairly thoroughly myself, and in general, I have not noticed a huge difference in air consumption between frog finning and flutter kicking myself. But what is important is low and deliberate movements. Trying not to go faster than you should with your finning and trying to control and know where you're going. And trying to, of course, have good buoyancy and move as little as possible. The lazy you are, and the more controlled and deliberate you are with your movements, the better your air consumption is going to be. So don't be just zipping around and trying to get to one place to the other as a race. Try to just relax and go as slow as you need. It's all about minimizing turbulence and maximizing your propulsion efficiency. If I missed any tips on air consumption, let me know. Or if you have your own stories to share on close calls or improvements to air consumption, please do share in the comments below. And as you're improving on your scuba diving journey, there's one place you often hear from a lot of different scuba divers, and it's a legendary experience that offers experiences that are unique to this one place in the entire world, and that is coral. If I piqued your interest, I have just a video for you to watch next. Check it out in this video here. Take care.